Today on Blue 58, training camp is still about two months away, but it's never too early to start speculating as to who's going to be on the final 53-man roster. Why? Well, in reality, most of the roster is already set. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Got a lot I want to get to on this episode, including, as I mentioned up top, our first roster prediction. Part of that involves... Of so movement at the wide receiver position, not so much movement as a, as a question. But a question a couple of weeks back via YouTube uh, did not catch the username on this one and was unable to find it when I went back because I couldn't remember which episode it was from. But recently we were talking about wide receivers, and a YouTube commenter pointed out or asked, I think half jokingly, but I'm not entirely sure, "Do you forget about Devin Funches?" And the honest answer is, yes. Did forget about Devin Punches. We've talked about him a little bit this offseason, but he's kind of the literally, literal, forgotten man in the Packers wide receiver picture. So let's talk about that for a second. Where does Devin Funches fit in the Packers wide receiver picture? If that title sounds familiar to you, it's because you've been to thepowersweep.com lately and uh, read the piece that I wrote there, published it yesterday by that same title. Go a little bit more in-depth there, but I want to talk through it a little bit. So the first and most important question here is, what is Devin Funches as a player? In short, as far as the Packers are concerned, he's basically Alan Lazard, another big-bodied receiver that can do sort of tight end-like things. Alan Lazard lined up a lot in the slot for the Packers, also lined up in a position that... uh, Pro Football Focus categorizes as in line, basically lined up as a tight end or H back. And if you're familiar with the backers, and if you're a listener of this podcast, you know that we've been calling that out for almost two years now. Uh, Matt Lafleur has something in his offense, a, a consistent role in his offense for a wide receiver blocking like a tight end. We've seen Alan Lazard play that role. We've seen Jay Kumaro play that role. We've seen Equinemi of St. Brown get a couple shots at doing that. Frequently, it will involve a bigger wide receiver motioning in from the slot and lining up uh, between or behind the left tackle and left guard or right tackle and right guard and kind of doing a kick-out block in there, just throwing an extra body in there. And a guy like Alan Lazard is really good at that because he's a big-bodied receiver anyway. Devin Funches did a little of that with the Carolina Panthers. He lined up in line a handful of times, played a lot of, uh, of snaps in the slot as a big slot receiver. It's easy to see the appeal here for the Packers. Signing him back in the spring of 2020, he's just another bigger version of, taller, maybe, version of Alan Lazard. They're about the same height, honestly. Um, Really similar physically. But that was then. This is now. Alan Lazard was one of the most efficient receivers in the league last season. Devin Funches was, for all intents and purposes, not in the league last season. He opted out for the 2020 season due to concerns over COVID-19. Good for him. Uh, But now he's back and took a big pay cut to be back. But where... Does he fit on the Packers? It's a numbers problem. Not even so much a role problem, though that is a secondary thing, but it's a numbers issue. The Packers are bringing back a whole bunch of players who got snaps at receiver last year. Jawan Winfrey, Bailey, uh, not Bailey Gaither, Reggie Bagleton, Equinemia St. Brown, uh, Malik Taylor. All of them played small, small roles on the Packers. The Packers brought in... Other guys, Bailey Gaither, Chris Blair, undrafted free agent and futures contract back in January, respectively. Then they drafted um, Amari Rogers, And then you've got the starting guys, the big guns, Devontae Adams, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and Lazard. Which of those guys do you take off the field to get Devin Funches on it? Certainly all of those smaller name guys, Winfrey, Gaither, Blair, Bagleton, Maybe even Equinemia St. Brown probably are coming into the season behind Devin Funches on the depth chart. I don't have to see Bailey Gaither on the field or Chris Blair on the field to know that even after a year away, Devin Funches is a better player. He's got more physical tools. He's done it before in the NFL. Uh, he's, he's just going to be better. But then you get to the problem of roles. Picture the Packers in 11 personnel last year. What were they doing? Well, they've got Devontae Adams out wide and probably Marquez Valdez-Scantling across from him on the other side of the field. 
You've got either Mercedes Lewis or Robert Tunyon at tight end. And you've got Tyler Irvin running some sort of motion across the field with Aaron Jones in the backfield. Those are your five quote-unquote skill position guys. Which of those roles do you take off the field for Devin Funchess on a consistent basis? Not Devontae Adams. He's staying. You're not going to replace um, Marquez Valdez-Scantling one-to-one with Devin Funchess. That's taken too much speed off the field. And he's not going to play the Tyler Irvin role. That's going to be Amari Rogers. Where do you put him? Do you add a third, fourth wide receiver, I guess, and take Robert Tunyon off the field? Okay. Tunyon can do some things that Funchess can't or line up in positions that he can't, unless they're thinking of him almost strictly as a tight end. But at that point, why don't you just leave Tunyon out there? You're not going to take him off if it's Mercedes Lewis out there in 11 personnel. And you're not going to put him in the Amari Rogers role. There's a couple of receivers on the field or on the roster already who are going to get a crack at that even ahead of him. If you want to get creative and do a three-receiver look with Adams, MVS, and Funchess, you could have MVS run motion. But even then that's probably not the ideal role for him. He's not a yards-after-the-catch type receiver in that kind of role. Kind of to the larger point, is there a role for Alan Lazard in that situation? It seems like a smaller and smaller package for him. And so I'm wondering, and even tending to believe, that Devin Funches, until proven otherwise, almost has to be on the outside looking in. Because once you get past those top three guys, you're really starting to look for people with special teams contributions. And no matter what Aaron Rodgers might say, that's why Malik Taylor made the roster last year ahead of Jay Kumaro. Sure, Kumaro may have had some slightly better upside in the offense. I don't think anybody's really going to quibble with that. But that's a pretty small role. And Taylor can return kicks. He's better on coverage than Kumaro was. He's faster and more athletic than Kumaro was. And the same kind of goes for Equinemia St. Brown. He's got special teams acumen, too. He's a gunner on on punt coverage. He can cover kicks, too. Just a big-bodied guy that has speed that Funchess doesn't have. So if it's between those three guys for spots, what, four, five, and six on the wide receiver depth chart— boy, it gets to be kind of a tough ask to put put Funches out there. Tough break for a guy after a year away. And I've seen the stuff on Instagram too. He looks like he's ready to go. But I think it's going to be tough to get him out there. If you start looking at the roster numbers, you can get it there. But you have to do some serious finagling. And uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. I want to talk about a question we got in the Discord server today as well. Flipping over to defense for a second, Pre- uh, Janelle asks, "How much more important are pressures in comparison to sacks?" I see pressures as more important because they do lead to sacks, interceptions, incompletions, and so on. Getting more consistent pressure throws an offense off rhythm. This is a great question, and I think what's important to call out here is Janelle recognizes that it's not an either-or thing either. So that is great. But if you're just going to have one, let's start here. What do you, what would you rather have? Would you rather have a pressure or a sack? I think it's obvious that we would rather have a sack. If you're just going to get one, you'd rather have a sack. But it's not just about one play. It's about performance over the course of a game or a season. So where is that dividing line? Are two pressures in a game better than one sack? Probably not, depending what those pressures lead to. Let's just say they lead to incompletions. Maybe, maybe not. Are three, are four, are five. Then you're starting to have a conversation. So how should we understand pressures in comparison to sacks? I think there is an analogy here that can be a little bit more helpful than just looking at them as one part of pressuring a quarterback versus another. Think about catches versus touchdowns on offense. Touchdowns are what you want to get because they get you closer to winning. And sacks probably get you a little bit closer to winning just by themselves, you know, relatively speaking, than a pressure does. But catches are still important. As an example, rewind with me back to 2013, the very last game of that regular season. Aaron Rodgers has returned from a broken collarbone, and the Packers are driving late. It is fourth and eight in Chicago Bears territory. 
and Aaron Rodgers takes the snap, picks up a nice little chip block from John Kuhn, rolls to his left around a sprawling Julius Peppers, and lofts a pass deep downfield in the cool night air to awaiting Randall Cobb, who takes it the rest of the way in for a touchdown. Now, who was the Packers' most important receiver in that game? Probably Randall Cobb, right? Yes, probably, but Cobb only had two catches for 55 yards, one of them the touchdown. Jordy Nelson was targeted 16 times, had 10 catches for 160 yards, no touchdowns, but he was a huge part of that offense that day. Do the Packers win without Randall Cobb? Maybe, maybe not. Do the Packers win without Jordy Nelson? I'd say almost certainly not. So there is a sort of spectrum there in contributions. Cobb gets to be the hero. What was the engine that got him there? The catches. I think the same is true of sacks and pressures. When you get a sack, you get to be the hero. And sacks are undeniably important. In fact, I think we've almost overcorrected here on pressures versus sacks. Analytics have done some good things on pointing out how important pressures are. But sacks are important too. And if you can regularly get to the quarterback and take him down, that is a huge asset to your team. But getting consistent pressures is hugely important. Hugely important. And that was one of the big reasons the Packers' pass rush was bad at the start of the season last year and better as the season went on. Almost everybody's pressure rate was down year over year. Rashawn Gary's went up a little bit, but Kenny Clark's was down. Preston Smith's was way down, though he came on towards the end of the season. Cesaria Smith's was down. But as they started to get more consistent pressure, the defense as a whole improved. That, I think, is the way that you kind of have to think about it. Pressure is on their own, just one in a vacuum, may not be that impactful. But if you are consistently getting pressure on the quarterback, it almost doesn't matter how many sacks you're actually getting. Good question from from Janelle in our Discord server. And if you would like to be a part of that Discord server, you can be, provided you are a supporter of the Patreon uh, drive we are doing. Patreon.com slash The Power Sweep is where you can become a patron. One dollar a month gets you in the door, but you can contribute any amount you like right up until right up to the multi-million dollar Jeff Bezos uh, extreme luxury tier. It is the same tier as everybody else. I just wanted to see how much you could contribute as a maximum on Patreon, and it's it's way up there. Please do not contribute that much. I would feel very bad because uh, I think the content we produce is good. It's not millions of dollars per month good. Though if you want to, get at me. We can figure out a way to make that work, I'm sure. Uh, but being a Patreon supporter gets you ask, access to the Discord, gets you some premium content as well. And uh, it's just a real fun time hanging out in the Discord with people from all over the world talking Packers and uh, helping to shape this podcast. So you are welcome there if you would like to join. We'd love to have you. And I would like to return to doing our Patreon shoutouts. Today I'm shouting out Jacob Kinbaum, Oliver Newport, and Raymond Fields. Each of these individuals has been a Patreon supporter since 2019. So thanks to each and every one of you and these three fellows in particular for supporting the Power Sweep. All right. Roster predictions. This is very early, obviously, not necessarily as early as we've done it in the past, but I think it's pretty straightforward um, to predict what the roster is going to look like in, um, in just a couple of months. Fewer positions are up for grabs than we are led to believe every year. Everyone likes to talk about the roster dark horses, the guys who are outside shots to make the roster. Those are nice stories, and who doesn't like to see an undrafted free agent come out of nowhere? They make the roster. Sam Shields, um, Tremond Williams, the list goes on. Lane Taylor. There are all kinds of guys if you want to figure it out. Heck, this year, uh, Lucas Patrick, a former undrafted free agent. Bunches and bunches of guys have made the leap in Packers history. Recent Packers history, even. But there are really not that many spots available to make that kind of leap. And I think you'll see that as we go through the roster here. So let's start right up at the top. Quarterbacks, who are we keeping right now? Right now, I'm saying Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love. They've got Blake Bortles in camp right now. Nice get-to-know-you span here for for a couple months. And then if they cut him, they can uh, theoretically bring him back in the practice squad if they want or go with uh, Kurt Bankert and uh, ride it out there. But I think it's going to be 
Rodgers and Love. And I guess this is my formal prediction that I think the Packers are going to work it out with Aaron Rodgers. I've, I've kind of been tiptoeing around that for a while now, but I think that the Packers and Rodgers are going to get it done. Uh, this is this is going to get sorted out, and um, I think it's it's going to be five months from now, and we'll be like, oh yeah, that was a storyline this offseason, as the Packers are 7-0 and and leading the NFC North or something like that. Uh, but I think it's going to be Rodgers and Love. They're going with the two-quarterback system, and if Love honestly isn't ready to be the number two, two quarterback right now, you might as well trade him. Um, you should be able to be the, the second quarterback in your second year if you are a first-round pick. Hot takes, I know, are flying. At running back, I think it's going to be Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, and Kylan Hill to start the season. Look, I've been stumping for Patrick Taylor for a while. I just don't think he gives you quite what Hill does in the passing game, though I wouldn't be surprised if they actually went with four running backs here. You'll notice no traditional fullbacks, but that's because the Packers' fullbacks are tight ends now. Uh, but I think everybody kind of understands how that goes. No real surprises there. Jones is locked in at the starter as the starter. A.J. Dillon um, is the solid backup there, and uh, it's going to be Hill or Taylor um, as as the third guy there. I just think it's going to be Hill right now. At receiver, circling back to the conversation we had up at the top, Devontae Adams, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and Alan Lazard are your unquestioned one, two, and three guys here. I don't think anybody... Really contest that. Um, you could say that Omari Rogers might be the number three guy just by virtue of the role that he plays. I wouldn't quibble with you. I think functionally he is going to be behind all of those guys in terms of, of snap counts. That doesn't mean his role is any less important, though. Beyond Adams, Valdez, Scantling, and Lazard, you've got Rogers, like we said. And then Malik Taylor, I think they're going to like his his special team acumen again. And then as the final wide receiver, I'm going to go with Equinemius St. Brown. I think he just gives you a little bit more on special teams than Devin Funchess does, but maybe they, they like Funchess enough to, to go with him ahead of Taylor or or EQ. I just don't see it right now. I think, uh, think those other two guys are going to have it ahead of him. Tight end, I don't think it, this is that complicated. Robert Tunyon, Mercedes Lewis, Josiah DeGuara, and Dominique Daphne. Yep, sorry, Jay Sternberger, you are on the outside looking in. He is redundant, I think, at two positions there. He's not as good as Robert Tunyon at what Tunyon does. He is certainly not as good as Mercedes Lewis as a blocker. And as an H-back, I don't think he's as good as DeGuara or Daphne. What do you want from Jay Sternberger at this point? Be a, a worse version of something you've already got elsewhere? It just doesn't seem to make sense to me, and I think it's time to move on. On the offensive line, I'm operating, uh, I guess, my second prediction here under the assumption that uh, David Bakhtiari is going to be on the physically unable to perform list to start the year. Everybody has said nice things about Bakhtiari and his progress so far, although if you look at the league as a whole, I don't think anybody has ever, in the history of the NFL, ever been behind in their ACL rehab. Uh, Everybody's always ahead of schedule, doing great. Well, that's great. We're going to have to see it in July and August enough so that we're convinced Bakhtiari can be full go to protect Aaron Rodgers in week one. It just doesn't seem like a a numbers game that is worth winning at that point. Why not let him get back, make it through the first month and a half in the season. You've got enough options there to make it work if you gotta. Bump Elton Jenkins out to left tackle, bump him to right tackle, put Billy Turner at left tackle. You can figure it out. Uh, There's enough there's enough juice there to get you through the first six weeks, and then he comes back in late October, and you're ready to go. Boom. Uh, so you've got Elton Jenkins then, Billy Turner, obviously, uh, Lucas Patrick, Josh Myers, and John Rennie. That's just the top five. I don't know where those guys are going to play. I think right now, if you you know held my feet to the fire, I would say it would be Billy Turner and Elton Jenkins at your tackles, whichever you want to do. Left tackle, right tackle, doesn't matter to me. Uh, Lucas Patrick and John Runyon Jr. as your guards, and then Josh Myers as your center. I will predict, I guess, as well that that Runyon or that uh, Myers is going to be the starting center, not super out of left field there. But I think you just don't need to overthink it. Put him at center, and uh, and away you go. He is a center. You need a center. Do it. Beyond that, we've got four more guys. While David Bakhtiari waits to come back from the physically unable to perform list, I think both of the Packers' late round or day three, I guess, draft picks uh, on the offensive line make it. Royce Newman and Cole Van Lannan are on the roster, as well as Simon Stepanak and Josh Nyman rounding out, giving us nine offensive linemen. uh, Sliding over to the defensive side of the field, we've got uh, the defensive line up first. Here are your starters. going to be Kenny Clark, Dean Lowry, and Kingsley Kiki. 
Uh, I think that is just your your functional starters, depending what the Packers want to do as far as um, you know dime defense and, and things like that. We're going to we're going to get in, into other looks and stuff like that. But those are going to be the guys that that lead the depth chart there. Beyond that, Tyler Lancaster and T.J. Slayton just don't see enough from other guys uh, to bump those. I think Slayton for sure uh, gets on the roster ahead of Lancaster. If the Packers got to cut somebody, it's probably going to be him. Maybe they like Anthony Rush, but I think those are my five for right now. At outside linebacker, it's kind of strange again how little depth the Packers have here. I would have liked to see a little bit more action towards um, pursuing edge rushers here, uh, but you've got at least two guys you feel pretty good about and a third guy who can be pretty good. Uh, Zadarius Smith and Rashawn Gary, your top two, Preston Smith right after them. And then I think run it back with Jonathan Garvin and Randy Ramsey again. I don't see anybody else on the roster who's going to unseat them there. At inside linebacker, Chris Barnes and Kamal Martin are your presumptive starters. Behind them, Ty Summers and Isaiah McDuffie in some order. I don't know. They're both mainly special teamers at this point anyway. I think you can find a role for them if you need to, but it's going to have to be in pretty small doses. Quarterback, Jair Alexander, Eric Stokes, and and Kevin King are probably the guys you want at the top of the depth chart. Uh, If we're looking at Jair Alexander in in the slot, I think we're looking at Stokes and King on the outside as your week one starters. But behind them pretty quickly is going to be Chandon Sullivan, Shamar Jean Charles, the fifth round pick, and then Kadar Holman rounding them out after that. Um, giving them uh, six corners there, as well as some special teams acumen in the form of uh, Kadar Holman. You will notice that I have cut Josh Jackson. Uh, We were talking about this in the Discord server a little bit. I get the appeal of a new defensive coordinator, you know, new new leaf for Josh Jackson, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to see it play out that way. I just don't think, um, relative to what other guys give you on the roster, he merits keeping at this point. Um, I think Shamar Jean Charles is going to do some of the stuff that he is supposed to be able to do. I think Shannon Sullivan already does a lot of the stuff that he's supposed to be able to do. I know that Joe Barry is supposed to be a little bit more zone heavy in terms of what he does on defense. But look, we heard that song and dance last year uh, with with Mike Pettin saying he wanted to do more zone so they could get Josh Jackson a little bit more involved. And guess what? It never really happened. So I think Jackson is on the outside looking in here. First and highest profile cut, I guess, would uh, from a Brian Gutekunst draft pick would, would have the second rounder from 2018 out the door. Safety. Uh, this one, again, is is just going to depend how many on, on they want to keep. You know the guys that they like. Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage, a great starting duo. Beyond them, you've got Will Redmond, kind of just by default, I think. We're going to have to see. I'm hoping that guys behind him that I still have making the roster, like Vernon Scott, Henry Black, and Christian Uphoff, the undrafted free agent making the roster, um, would unseat them. That would give you more room, say you wanted to keep a seventh receiver or a third quarterback. I've already got 26 players on defense versus 24 on offense, um, so that would give them them a little bit of extra extra room if they could find a way to to move on from Redmond and go with one of the three younger guys. But I think they are going to go pretty safety heavy, given what we know about Barry's defense and its reliance on safeties. Uh, so I've got them taking six right here. Then for specialists, J.K. Scott holds off his challenger in camp, as does Mason Crosby. But Hunter Bradley does not. We've got a new long snapper in town, and that's Joe Fortunato. Uh, taking over for Hunter Bradley. Another 2018 draft pick goes by the boards. So there we go. There's my 53-man roster prediction here on May 20th, 2021. Am I completely wrong? I hope not. Am I mostly wrong? I hope not there too. But if you've got predictions, if you've got things that you think are going to go a little bit differently, I would be interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, Get at me at YouTube, on social media, or, again, hanging out in the Power Sweeps Discord server. Uh, however you do it, if you enjoyed this show and think somebody else would enjoy it, uh, go ahead and do me a favor and share it with that person you think would, would like it. That's going to help us grow this show and get more people involved in this conversation we're having around the Packers and ultimately help everybody become smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.